Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. Today we'll be continuing our breakdown of Star Wars Squadron's ships. So far we've looked at the multi-purpose New Republic fighter, the X-Wing. Today we'll be moving on to the Empire's multi-purpose fighter, the TIE in Space Superiority Fighter. Like in our last video, we'll be looking at the specs and details along with the combat and design history of each craft along with how they will be able to perform in Star Wars Squadron. Now before we begin, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our Star Wars Squadron coverage. After the Clone Wars ended and the Empire rose to power, it was certain that Quant Systems Engineering would dominate the competition and win the next major starfighter contract for the Empire. Quant had already secured the Imperial-class Star Destroyer contract, which would form the backbone of the new Imperial Navy. But they had one other competitor in Senior Fleet Systems, guided by the ambitious and wealthy engineer Wraith Senior. Senior Fleet Systems was far smaller in its production scale when compared to Quant Drive Yards. But Wraith Sinyar had a key ally in Moff Wilhuf Tarkin. It was also rumored that Sinyar designed Palpatine's own personal yacht, the Imperialis. But most importantly, Wraith Sinyar was willing to bend knee to the Empire, whereas Quat Drive Yard's leadership has historically remained independent from any galactic government. And so during the fall of the Republic and the nationalization of the galaxy's military industrial complex, several of Quat Drive Yard's assets were seized by the Empire and then given to Senior Fleet Systems to balance out the competition. Prior to acquiring these assets, Senior Fleet Systems was mainly known for making highly customized ships with prototype experimental technology on them. The Scimitar Star Courier, used by Darth Maul, was one of those designs. It featured a prototype Psy-Tai twin ion engine design. This was an incredibly efficient ion propulsion system that supplemented its power through solar panels. The Psy-Tai engine would be the precursor to the PS4 twin ion engine used aboard the TIE series of starfighters for the entire reign of the Galactic Empire. And so drawing inspiration from Clone Wars era designs and using the Shimitar's prototype engine, the TIE in space superiority fighter was born. In the first five years after the rise of the New Order, the Galactic Imperial Navy would essentially use old Republic Starfighter designs, which they would gradually phase out as more tie in space superiority fighters became available. This short range interceptor would serve the Empire well for the first decade of its rule. The fighter would be posted all across the Empire's territory on starships, space stations, and ground bases, and fight all kinds of threats ranging from local rebel cells separatist holdouts to pirate gangs and newly encountered alien factions. But as the Alliance to Restore the Republic began to organize and field their own starfighter corps of advanced snub fighters, the basic TIE fighter was beginning to show its age. After the Battle of Yavin, where TIE fighters failed to stop a small squadron of X-Wings and Y-Wings from destroying the Death Star, the Empire began scrambling to find a replacement for the TIE in space superiority fighter. So as we mentioned before in our X-Wing video, the Clone Wars was very much a battleground for the future of starfighter technology. The poor performance of larger, more expensive, and over-engineered starfighters like the ARC-170 Starfighter led the Republic to favor smaller, simpler, and cheaper designs. Starships like the Alpha-3 Nimbus V-Wing along with the Jedi ETA Actus Interceptor performed much better during this conflict, and so the Republic started putting more investment in designing these types of ships. The TIE Fighter was essentially a combination of the best elements of these Republic fighters combined with that advanced ion drive from Senior Fleet Systems we just talked about. The TIE Fighter was an incredibly cheap and simple fighter to design as basic equipments like shields, hyperdrives, and even life support systems were removed from the ship in order to save costs and weight. What you essentially had was one of the most maneuverable starfighters in the galaxy. In many ways, Wraith Senior's development of the TIE in space superiority fighter mirrored the famous Japanese engineer Jiro Horikoshi's design of the Mitsubishi A6M0 fighter, which also featured a very similar low weight and low armor design philosophy. The TIE fighter's design actually fits in perfectly with Emperor Palpatine's own plans for the galaxy. You see, Palpatine's military first ideology was designed to encourage as many citizens of the Empire to enlist in the Imperial Navy as possible. Under his rule, the military-industrial complex would expand and suck up other industries and eventually dominate the economic landscape. 
Therefore, the TIE fighter needed to be extremely modular, as well as cheap to build and assemble, to meet the Imperial Navy's massive demand for the ship. Because the Imperial Navy was now more or less policing the galaxy instead of fighting another conventional military force, the TIE fighter was mainly facing civilian threats and didn't need to be heavily armed or have advanced defenses, so the TIE's simplistic design was adequate for the job. Palpatine also wanted the TIE fighter to simultaneously make Imperial pilots dedicated, but also compliant. The maneuverability, speed, and lack of shields that the TIE fighter possessed meant that the pilots had to be extremely skilled in order to survive. The ship was vulnerable to even the smallest collisions from micrometeors. So there was definitely a huge amount of pride and elitism amongst those who flew the TIE fighter. The danger of their position united them and created a very close-knit community. At the same time, each TIE fighter pilot was actually randomly assigned to a starship. This way, they would never get used to flying one ship or feel ownership over one ship. And due to the lack of hyperdrive and life support, it was incredibly hard for a TIE fighter pilot to steal one of these ships and defect to the Rebellion without support. Now, just a reminder, the specs we're going to give you might be slightly altered in Star Wars Squadrons for balancing purposes. There's also going to be plenty of opportunities to modify the ship yourself with aftermarket parts. The TIE Fighter was only 7.24 meters in length. Next to an F-150 pickup truck and an X-Wing, it would look kind of like this. The TIE Fighter featured a pair of PS4 ion engines that were supplemented by two large solar panels on the S-foils. Because the TIE Fighter lacked shields and a hyperdrive and life support, the propulsion system had access to a huge amount of reserve energy, which could boost the TIE Fighter to extremely fast speeds if necessary. There was also a pre-functionary oxygen scrubber on board and the cockpit was pressurized, but basically the pilots still had to have their own oxygen supply. Now, since the TIE fighters basically wore pressurized suits in their cockpits, there was an ejection seat available for emergency situations. There was also a minimal supply of food and water stored on the TIE fighter that could last for around two days as well. It was designed to sustain the pilot post-battle long enough for rescue crews to come to the battlefield and pick them up. But without a hyperdrive, a TIE fighter was heavily dependent on a carrier for any kind of survival long term. For offensive weapons, the TIE fighter had two LS-1 laser cannons. They were quite powerful when compared to the X-Wing's lasers and made up for their lack of heavy weapons on board the fighter, although aftermarket missile launchers could be added to a TIE fighter. It's essentially what the First Order would do later on. They would add a concussion missile launcher so that the TIE fighter was a little more deadly when fighting against capital ships. While the TIE fighter might seem outclassed on paper compared to the very well-equipped X-Wing, the TIE fighter does have two main advantages. One is its maneuverability. The TIE fighter will be able to initiate tighter turns than an X-Wing in a dogfight, and also will have more power accessible for the thrusters, which means it will have faster sublight speeds. The TIE fighter's systems can also be rerouted to the weapons, which allow the laser to fire a huge overpowered burst that could easily overcome an X-Wing's shields and armor. The energy management system on a TIE fighter was also a lot more advanced, efficient, and rapid at diverting energy from one system to another. This is again because of Rathsinyar's prototype ion drive. It should be mentioned too that when extra energy is diverted to the weapons of a TIE fighter, it will also decrease the speeds of the ship significantly, leaving it an open target. And lastly, it's important to get as much simulator time as possible, especially with these TIE fighters, so that you can take advantage of its unique advantages and very big disadvantages. So there you have it guys, that is our breakdown of the TIE Fighter, which I think will be really interesting to see in action. We'll basically have to see how well balanced it is compared to the X-Wing, which obviously has shields, whereas the TIE Fighter does not. Maybe they'll produce more careful pilots who are less prone to put themselves in dangerous positions. Who knows? Let me know in the comment section below what you think about the TIE Fighter. Also, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of the series. And as usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.